Chapter 9 of Dog Watches at Sea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dog Watches at Sea by Stanton H. King. Chapter 9 Burying the Dead Horse While the Hagerstown was being hauled through the docks, the attention of one of the sailors was fastened on me. He was a tall, raw-boned, kind-hearted Irishman, a thorough seaman, who, although under the influence of the firewater, did his work and conducted himself in a manner satisfactory to the officers. He had been an officer on American sailing ships, and knew what to expect. With two others like himself, he kept out of the way while the after end was subduing the pugnacity of the forward crowd. He was sent aft to get some seizing stuff, and standing in the lazarette, his head visible above the small catch homings, he looked at me so closely as to make me uncomfortable. I kept moving the wheel and steered in the wake of the towboat. What is your name, boy? he asked. King, I replied. Where were you born? In Barbados, in the West Indies. My answers seemed to please him. That night he was called by the second mate for his watch, and during our first watch on deck we became friends. He knew the sailor's boarding house where I had left my clothes, and spoke of it as the worst dive in Antwerp. When we went below at twelve o'clock, he overhauled his bag and fitted me out with a dry shift of clothing. During the passage, my kind friend O'Brien made over some of his Western Ocean wardrobe to fit me. He could use a sewing needle as skillfully as he could a marlin spike. So with what he gave me, and the few things I drew from the slop chest I was comfortably supplied. The bad idea that boys were slaves prevailed on this ship. The ordinary seamen of the port watch, like myself in the starboard watch, were soon made to understand that the dirty work of keeping the forecastles clean fell to us, while the men stretched themselves out in their pews. Besides this, we were expected to trim the oil lamp, bring the food from the galley, and return the empty pans and kettles. I expected to do this menial service all the trip across, to take uncomplainingly all ill treatment, and to speak only when asked to do so, but fortune favored me. On the evening of the seventh day out, O'Brien told me I need not bring the breakfast to the forecastle in the morning. My boy, you have had your spell of flunkeyism for us flatfoots. Tomorrow I will get the breakfast, and I will clean up the forecastle for a week. Every man forward will take his turn at it, and we will be in Philadelphia before your turn comes again. At seven bells we were called to get our breakfast, to be ready at eight o'clock to relieve the watch on deck. Instead of going to the galley for the food, I waited, knowing that O'Brien had gone for it. In the forecastle was a Russian Finn, who struck me on the side of the head with the flat of his hand, and ordered me to fetch the grub. O'Brien, entering with the pan of cracker hash, was just in time to witness the blow. He put the pan down, and with one blow felled the Russian to the deck. Then, standing erect, filled with anger, he declared that he was flunky for this week, and every mother's son would have to take a turn at keeping the folk so clean. Turning to me, he said, King, if any man in this ship imposes on you, let me know, and I'll settle his hash. O'Brien proved a friend in many ways. He was my protector. He taught me to handle a marlin spike, 
and had promised to take me along to the weather earing of the topsail if an opportunity to reef her down was given. We must have been halfway across when the tail end of a West Indian hurricane reached us. This was the opportunity I had longed for. Both watches were on deck to get the muslin in. While going aloft I kept close to the heels of my friend. With the wind howling and screeching through the rigging, we reached the main topsail yard. Out to the yard arm I followed, and holding on to the lift, swung myself into the Flemish horse. Seated astride the end of the yard, bracing my body against the lift, I took my first lesson in passing a reef earring. The noise and shouting of the men hee-hawing while hauling the sail out to windward was sweet music to me. Having turns enough on the earring to hold it, O'Brien whispered, Shout! Haul out to lowered! Filled with pride, I shouted, Haul out to lowered! I could see the contemptuous expression on some of the men's faces. They thought I was being spoiled by O'Brien's kindness, and that he allowed me to be cheeky. The sail was reefed, and word came from deck to make it fast. The gale was of short duration. The heavy force of it lasted about six hours, but during that time both watches were kept busy getting the upper topsails and mainsail stowed. When it began to moderate, and the sails were set, it was a revelation to hear how much noise a few men singing a chorus could make. At the topsail halyards, Frisco let off the first chanty, Blow the man down. As the others joined in the refrain, Why, hey, blow the man down, they threw the weight of their bodies back and joyfully mastheaded the yards. Much has been written about shanties, and some writers have joined words to the music, but I have never heard two men use just the same words. The shanty man leads off, and if he is good at rhyming, will make one about the virtues and failings of ship and officers. All the men were good at singing and shouting, so we seldom hauled on a halyard, bowline, or sheet without someone starting a shanty. Even at the pumps we would suck her out with storm along, a woeful dirge that runs somewhat after this manner. Stormy is dead, he'll storm no more. To me way hey, storm along. Old storm is dead, he'll storm no more. To me I, 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 mister, storm along. We'll dig his grave with a golden spade. To me way hey, storm along. We'll dig his grave with a golden spade. To me, I, 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 mister, storm along. We'll lower him down with a silver chain. To me way hey, storm along. We'll lower him down with a silver chain. To me, I, 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 mister, storm along. One evening, when we were just twenty-nine days at sea, near the banks, and although it was midsummer, the night was cold, my good friend came up on the forecastle head, where I was stationed on the lookout, and wrapped his warm pea-jacket around me. We walked the forecastle deck together. I had often wondered why he did so much for me. This night we talked of Barbados. He said he knew my parents, and related this incident. About three years ago, I deserted from an English bark in Barbados. We had brought a cargo of general merchandise from London, and were taking back sugar. There was very little to eat, and the old tub was in a wretched condition. I sold some of my clothes to the Negro stevedores for rum. As is always the case, when rum is in, the man is out. I stowed myself in a lighter and reached the shore. I made for the country when I sobered up and hid myself in the cane fields till I thought the old bark had sailed away. Then I wandered about until I was ragged. Not even the negroes noticed me. 
One day I was walking on the white sandy beach. I saw several trees with fruit that looked like apples on them. I ate one. It blistered my mouth. The juice blistered my hands. It got into my eyes and blinded me. It was the poisonous manchineel berry. It rained, and the drops falling from the leaves of the trees blistered my body. I should have died, but your mother, hearing of my distress, sent out her servants and brought me into her house. She gave me every care till I was able to be around. She clothed and fed me, and gave me a letter to her friend, the American consul, asking him to aid me in getting another ship. Although you have changed a little, the first day I came aboard I thought I knew you. I remembered telling you stories of the sea. It is for her sake, lad, I have befriended you. I could not see her son acting as servant to any of us. When you write home, give my regards to your good mother. The first opportunity I had in Philadelphia, I wrote home, relating my meeting with O'Brien and the kindness he had bestowed upon me. In my mother's next and last letter to me, she wrote, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. When the crew was shipped, an advance note of one month's wages was granted each man. These notes were kept by the boarding masters, who took every precaution to have the men sail in the ship. Then, at the expiration of forty-eight hours after sailing, they could get the notes cashed. A donkey's breakfast, a pot, pan, and spoon, and a bottle of rum was the outfit most of the men received for their month's advance. The Belgian hadn't that much. Besides his advance note, he had paid a small sum of money for the privilege of becoming a slave for a few weeks. Now that we had been at sea a month, every man felt that this, a day of all days, was a fresh starting point in his career. Now he began to work for himself. No longer did he toil for the boarding master. I heard the men talk about burying the dead horse, and watched with keen interest their work of stuffing the animal. They secured some old grain sacks, which were in the forepeak, cut out the figure of a horse, and sewed the parts together. Each man gave a bit of straw from his donkey's breakfast, and this, with some old yarns from the shakings barrel, they stuffed into the gunny sack horse. Although it would have suggested any other animal just as readily, it answered the purpose and created the desired merriment. During the six to eight dog watch, they brought forth the beast. Then some kicked and others scrambled to get a hit at him. This representative of the month's wages given to the boarding masters was hauled up on the forecastle head, and here we had the fun to ourselves. The men entered so heartily into the frolic that I would have given the boarding master a month's advance so that, like them, the horse might have had a real meaning to me. No crowd of schoolboys could have appreciated the fun of the hour more than they did. I cannot remember the words of the trial, nor the verdict of the court, nor the sentences of the funeral service. I have witnessed a few dead horse scenes, but have never heard the same words. Standing in front of the horse with a book in his hands, Frisco occasionally rolled his eyeballs upward and in a comical, memorized rigmarole, expatiated on the virtues and failings of the beast. For a few minutes he kept the crowd convulsed with laughter. When he finished the sentence with, So you must die, he struck the stuffed horse a blow on the head with a serving mallet, and began the burial service. After this bit of facetiousness, we carried the horse to the lee cathead 
and roared out the chanty, Poor old man, your horse is going to die. Frisco, the life of the crowd, and always to the front, led off. Poor old man, your horse is going to die, and I say so, and I hope so. O oh, poor old man, your horse is going to die, O oh, poor old man. Here are other verses, though my pen cannot do justice to the vigor of the rendering. For thirty days we've ridden him, and I say so, and I hope so. For thirty days we've ridden him, O oh, poor old man. When he's dead, we'll tan his skin, and I say so, and I hope so. When he's dead, we'll tan his skin, O oh, poor old man. At the conclusion of the shanty, he was tossed over the rail, and thus ended the celebration of the end of the days of toil for the boarding master. The food was plentiful and substantial. We had splendid hard bread, and a cook who could make a variety from the beef, pork, and other stores. All sorts of names were applied to the different kinds of food. For instance, rice was known as strike me blind. Oatmeal porridge, or burgoo, was stirabout. Molasses was long-tail sugar. Salt beef old junk, hard biscuit, soaked in pea soup, dog's body. This, with a little molasses added and baked in the oven, was dandy funk. In most ships, the same terms are familiar to seamen. My hands and fingernails were beginning to whiten from the tar of the previous ship when the work of tarring down our rigging began. What a difference there is in ships. The Hagerstown, unlike the Ruby, had an abundance of tar and ship stores. With plenty of seizing stuff, the rat lines were straightened and considerable sailorizing accomplished. O'Brien took pains to teach me, and I learned rapidly from the seizing on of a Scotchman to the making of a sword mat a Flemish eye, and a paunch mat. We reached the banks and were enveloped in fog for days, ever on the alert for the sound of a steamer's whistle or the toot of a sailing ship's foghorn. All the sail the ship could carry was set to hasten her through it, and every precaution was taken by keeping a bright lookout and constantly sounding the foghorn. On one of these nights of fog, the starboard watch was below. I was awakened by someone pounding on the side of the forecastle, and a voice at the door yelling, Get on deck and save yourselves. In a moment the watch was on deck. The fog was dense. It was impossible to see twenty feet ahead. Close to us, was the white side of a mountain of ice. For a moment I held my breath and anxiously watched the iceberg fall astern. It was a close call. The man at the wheel quickly obeyed the order to starboard your helm, which saved us from striking head on to the ice. At last we sailed out of the fog, no danger having befallen us, and kept on for the Delaware Capes. Standing off a lee shore in a heavy gale is a trying time for the captain of an ocean greyhound, even though he has steam at his command to keep his vessel to the wind and sea. With a sailing ship it means carry on and beat your way off, or be dashed upon the rocks. Running before an easterly gale and a heavy sea, we were in close proximity to the capes. It would have been a great relief to make the land before dark. Failing this meant to beat off the lee shore all night. 
It was a great strain on Captain Boyd. He was compelled to carry on sail and driver through the seas. Every two hours the watch was called to tack ship, and then ordered to stand by, ready for another call. The old man was on deck all night, and took command in putting her about. Call the watch! Ready about! A noise and a yell, get on deck and get her round, brought all hands to their stations. It took every man to haul the mainsail up. At the command, main topsail haul, it seemed as though the mast would be wrenched from the deck. The violent swing of the yards would sway them almost back again before the slack of the main braces was hauled in. The gale filling her canvas, she would plunge and bury herself, then trembling and shaking would rise on the crest of another wave. There was no room to wear, so all night she dove through the boiling seas with lower to gallant set, drenching herself fore and aft. At daylight a pilot boat hailed us and put a pilot on board. We were in sight of land. A large ocean tug steamed out and bargained with our captain to tow us in. At such a time the sailor feels at his best. The voyage is drawing to a close, and his heart is light and filled with cheer. Though he may have no friends on shore, no one to greet and welcome him, still he is happy in the expectation of a change and a run on shore with a few dollars to spend. Hand over hand, the hawser is hauled up on deck and paid out to the tug. In a few minutes, we are aloft like birds in a tree, and each watch is doing its best to put a snug harbor furl on the sails. O'Brien told me he was going to New York as soon as he could get what money was due him. He advised me to ask the captain's permission to remain on the ship. So I went aft and made my desire known to the old man. Certainly, my boy, don't leave the ship, and when the boarding-house runners come aboard, give them a wide berth. This I did. We were a long distance from Philadelphia when the sharks clambered on board. Rum was plentiful. Every man was tagged for some boarding house, and when we tied up near Chester, where the empty oil barrows were to be discharged, the sailors with their dunnage were tumbled into a tug and carried to the city. The Hagerstown remained at the oil wharf for some days, and when we were towed up to the city, the crew had been discharged. I tried to find my good benefactor, but learned from Frisco, who was holding up the dives of Philadelphia, that O'Brien had left for New York. Captain Boyd was very kind. He allowed me to remain on the ship, and when paying me my wages, advised me in a fatherly manner to take care of my money and to keep clear of the sailor's district. He promised to take me with him to San Francisco, and intended to put me on the ship's articles on his return from a trip down east. While this good friend was on his vacation, Mr. Hanscom, the old watchman, and I had the ship to ourselves. All the crew officers as well as seamen were discharged. The stevedores were loading a general cargo for San Francisco, and as there was plenty of work a strong boy could do, I engaged myself with them for fifteen cents an hour. I earned enough to buy a snug outfit of shoes and clothing, and enjoyed the little I spent while visiting the old shipkeeper. Mr. Hanscom and his family were members of a Baptist church. I attended service with them, and under the influence of that good home, 
resolve to fight against the temptations that are put in a sailor's way. I wrote home to my mother, telling her of the friends I had made. I felt a new spirit enter my being. Good influence held me back from the downward path for a while. When the old man returned, he was pleased at Mr. Hanscom's report of my good behavior, but to my great disappointment, Captain Boyd told me he was not going on the Hagerstown. My hopes were blasted, as I had intended asking him to ship me as able seaman. I lost all desire to sail in her without Captain Boyd. Accordingly, next day I strolled over to Point Breeze on the Schuylkill River, and there saw several ships loading oil. Among these was an American, the St. Augustine, of about 2,000 tons register, loading for Kobe, Japan. The stevedores were sliding the cases of oil down the hatches. Everybody seemed busy. There were two well-dressed men on board who were, I learned, captain and mate. I had set my heart on making this trip, so I approached, and lifting my hat, inquired if the captain was on board. The elder of the two replied, Yes, I'm captain. What do you want? I told him, and in a few minutes was on my way to Mr. Hanscom with good news. I was to make a voyage to Japan with Captain Thomas on the American Clipper, St. Augustine. I was to go as ordinary seaman at twelve dollars a month. It was not necessary to take my things to Point Breeze, as the St. Augustine was to be towed to the wharf at the old navy yard where the Hagerstown was moored, to get her stores and crew on board. I was glad, on landing my things on her deck, to be told by Mr. Parker, the mate, that I was to put them in the bosun's room, as I was to bunk it with him. The St. Augustine was much smaller than the Hagerstown, single to gallant sails and no skysails. Her cabin and forecastle were the same, except that instead of a forecastle for each watch, there was a large undivided space with sixteen bunks in it. In a place where ten men could, possibly, move with comfort, sixteen were expected to eat, sleep, and smoke while they were on board. The sailing day came. My life seemed full. I had heard of the knowledge in seamanship gained by rounding the Cape of Good Hope. Now I was on my way to accomplish such a feat. The boarding masters brought the men down, tumbled them and their dunnage on deck, and kept a careful watch lest any man should leave the ship. Three months' advance had been granted the crew, and the land sharks intended that none of their prey should escape. Some less drunk than others helped haul the lines in. The towboat took hold of us. I made for the wheel, and steered in the wake of the tug till we dropped anchor a few miles down the Delaware. Besides the sixteen men forward, there were eight others on board, Captain Thomas and Mr. Parker the mate a young man about twenty-two years old, bright and active. Though a mere boy, he was a competent sailor and a good boxer and wrestler. The second mate was a middle-aged man who abused his authority by constantly cursing and swearing at the men. The boatswain was a strong Liverpool Irishman who fought all the battles of the ship and made my existence wretched. Chips, the carpenter, a Norwegian who had sailed for years in deep-water American ships, was now so Americanized that he delighted to apply the term Dutchman to the Scandinavians forward. He considered his position of so much importance that it was a condescension to speak to the men. 
His rank, like the bosun's, was a step from the forecastle, where they had both lived, so that they knew what a sailor's life is. But they were the haughtiest and most overbearing of our after superiors. If they gave us a kind word, their manner clearly showed it was a voluntary descent from their dignity. The cook was an old negro. He had his wife with him, a bright mulatto, about twenty-five years old. She was rather a pleasant-featured woman, down on the articles as stewardess. It would have been better for him had he left his wife in Philadelphia. The ship would have had a steward. She could not then have roused his jealousy and suspicion. As it was, he was made miserable, and through the inconstancy of his wife he lost his life. There were two bunks in the boatswain's room. He took the upper and left me the lower. There was a table about two feet square in the room, and at it I ate my meals. The boatswain, carpenter, and second mate ate aft at the second sitting of the cabin table. The first night on board, the bulky Liverpool Irishman took a dislike to me. We had turned in, but I could not sleep. I have heard loud snoring, but none has ever equaled in volume the blast of the boatswain's foghorn. I was restless, and hoping that he might change his music to some other tune, bumped my knees against the bottom of his bunk boards. At last he roused himself and swore at me for disturbing him. I ventured to tell him that his snoring kept me awake, whereupon he jumped from his bed and inflicted a thrashing which I shall never forget. If there had been a chance to skip out, I should have done so, but I went to bed again, knowing my best plan was to keep quiet and submit to this abuse. The men were allowed to sleep away their dissipation, but at three o'clock next morning, sick and fatigued, they were put to work filling the empty water cask on deck from the Delaware River. It was cold, and the October winds pierced their vitals. Sparks began to come from the galley stovepipe, and at five o'clock old Wilson, the cook, served hot black coffee. Why do I say black coffee? I have never seen any other kind served to seamen. Generally, it is sweetened with molasses, which gives it the flavor of a quack blood and nerve tonic. Now came the word, man the windlass. Up and down went the windlass brakes. The hot drink gave new life to the men. One, with a voice like a bull of Bashan, led off with the shanty, Sally, Sally Brown was a Creole lady, way I roll and go. Sally Brown was a Creole lady, spend my money on Sally Brown. Seven long years I courted Sally, way I roll and go. Seven long years and she would not marry, spend my money on Sally Brown. Sally Brown, I now must leave you, way I roll and go, and do not let this parting grieve you, spend my money on Sally Brown, and so ad infinitum. Although wet and uncomfortable, the others, like true shellbacks, joined heartily in the chorus. The clank of the pauls sounded clear and distinct between the chorus and the song of the shantyman. As one finished, another man would start a different shanty. Poor Paddy works on the railroad. We're all bound to go, till the mate shouted, She's short, sir! Now was the time for Mr. Williams to give free play to his vile vocabulary and for the boatswain to exercise his strength. 
Curses were heaped on the men loosing the sails, while a constant uproar was taking place on deck. The riggers had rove the running rigging through the wrong fair leads, which elicited a blessing from Mr. Williams on every man that ever handled the rope. The topsail set, the strong tide and wind in our favor, we started the anchor from the mud, and headed for the open sea on our way to Japan. End of chapter 9